veteran right here. I just want to say, you know, I was in the session, uh, last session, um, that was about uh, what, we, what we can do to create advocacy for drug sellers. So that's a real indication that even with regulation of marijuana and all the other great work that's being done, we have further to go. And I think when two years ago we were in Denver, how many people were in Denver two years ago? All right. So two years ago was very exciting. The law in Colorado had just passed. Everybody was feeling very hopeful and really felt like it was opening up and there was a lot of possibility for other drugs to be part of the conversation and to talk about legal legalization of other substances. This panel originally started as Will MDMA be next? <laughs> and it has evolved to a larger conversation about legal access of all psychedelics, different types of psychedelics, and the different ways that it's going to happen. And it's really meant to be a visionary sort of conversation, because I don't know that we've spent a lot of time thinking or talking about what it might look like, how it would be the same or different from what's happened with marijuana. And so we've got really smart, amazing people up here that are going to explain what it looks like to them, what legal access to psychedelics look like to them. And we have a few different models that are going to be explained. They are by no means all of the possibilities, but we're highlighting about four of them. And so the format of this session is, I'm going to, um, we're going to start off by hearing from Paula Frango who is here for, with us from Portugal, so that we can understand the difference really between decriminalization and what legal access is. So she's going to give us a, a, a reminder, a refresher, because I think a lot of us are already familiar with how Portugal's system works. Um, and I'll let her do that in a moment. And then we're going to go through one by one to hear about four different models of legal access. And then we'll get uh, a final comment about what we can do incrementally to help lead us there, perhaps. And then we'll have a little conversation and discussion, and then you'll have a chance to participate. So I'm going to mostly try and stay out of the way on this session. I'm going to be a, a timekeeper for these folks, and I'll ask you to help me remind them if they're going over time. Uh, but I want to get started again with uh, Paula Frango. She will introduce herself and her role in Portugal's Ministry of Health. So, good afternoon. So again, thank you very much for inviting me to come here to to, camp, to, to give uh, my experience and to share what was the experience of Portugal in this question. Uh, I am I have been doing social work in psychology and actually I work in drug field since 2000, exactly the year when the law was uh, implemented. So you can imagine that in that time uh, we faced in Portugal, especially in the 90s, um, a big, big, huge problem related to um, the use of uh, heroin. And at that time it was a question that touched most of the families in the direct or indirect way. So it was a big concern for Portuguese society at the time. Uh, actually, took people, it took people from all the levels of society, riches, poor, and so on. And um, the government decided that uh, something had to be done. And uh, the, the, we had, uh, at that time, uh, a primitive uh, frame, legal frame, that people were uh, cr uh, criminalized the uh, system. And then the, the, the government realized that it was not the, the, the way to face the problem. And actually they decided to, to do, and I think it, this is the point of turning uh, on all the question. Uh, they decided to study what happened, study all over the Europe, what was the models that, uh, what was the interventions, the practices that were, um, that were uh, implemented to face and they created a group group work that went to see what was happening and they uh, it, could be, it was very interesting because it was formed by different people different experts from different areas the point was 
see the problem uh, beside the moral point of view that was uh, um, at the moment uh, in, in, in time at what, what, uh, uh, besides the moral point of view. So uh, they write a strategy, the first national strategy to face the, the, the drug problems and they decided to go along a little bit more and try to uh, define a new legal frame. The new legal frame it was decriminalization. So decriminalization means that um, we're still in the primitive frame, but uh, it's not anymore a crime to use and to have uh, drugs to consume. So they define, I, I brought you the law, they translate it for, port, for English, uh, you can take some, I, I, some, I brought some materials for you. They are available on our website in Portugal, in the CICA website, which is the agency for whom I work. Um, and uh, uh, what, what, what happened it was, it, it was a, a, a very innovative and uh, very step that was taken in that time, but the question was that everybody in Portuguese society was interested in changing things. Even the church, which we are a Catholic country, as you may know, even the church were interested in facing the problem. So the law came out, and but along with the law uh, were defined a set of measures that uh, were implemented to face the problem uh, to, uh, to face a problem, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, to face the problem uh, with measures to intervent, policy measures to intervent. So the, the, the range of measures was, was prevention, treatment, um, social rehabilitation and harm reduction. These measures were implemented by a national agency that was created to, to implement all of this. And nationally, all over the country were created centers, um, were treatment centers, uh, teams to, to work in prevention, to develop programs. Myself was responsible for five years for implementing the prevention program. So, um, for vulnerable people, party goers and so on. So the, the, the legal frame was very important, of course. Uh, it was no possible anymore to, to incarcerate people because the use of drugs it, it, it took it, lots of problems related with that. But uh, the, the question for me is that it was not, not only a, a legal frame, it was a, an intervention plan that was set to face. And uh, I worked in that plan. You can imagine how exciting it was at, uh, at the time to re realize that we are building something that was really innovative. And, uh, and they, the government gave the possibility to the, the, the professionals, to the teams, to the people that start implementing all the plan, national plans, uh, to do innovative things, and we did it. And uh, of course, nowadays uh, we face another uh, problems related to the use of drugs. Of course, the use and abuse of drugs, the new, sub the new psychoactive substances are a big challenge for everybody. And uh, we know that we can't anymore face that kind of, uh, uh, we can't approach uh, these new patterns of use, these new substances that are coming. Uh, the same way, and I think the challenge nowadays is for one side to can reach this kind of new patterns, this kind of new substances from, with different strategies, not anymore uh, the ones that we know and that we develop, but also the ones related to uh, the net, uh, net reaching, and lots of things that are possible and are interesting to, to approach and to improve. Uh, I think that what was interesting in, in Portuguese policy it was that the, the, the base of the plan was uh, at the time <coughs> defined by not a morality, not a kind of ideological issues, but they tried to base it in 
kitty dance. So uh, what I must say to you <coughs> is that it's in the fight, it's, it's important, we must go along. It's not, it's not possible to incarcerate people because of the use of the drugs. Uh, but uh, uh, it's important to, to study what is happening, to raise the, all the problems in the evidence, in the best practices that are going on, and to uh, involve society, uh, civil society. It was what happened in Portugal. All the, the civil society NGOs were involved in, of, in the implementing of the plan. So I think it was very important for the success. And what worked? Really, what was the fear? It, it was that the, the link, an increase of substance use, which, which was not happened for one side. From the other side, uh, the, the health was improved, uh, individual health and social well-being, because at that time, drugs were the fifth preoccupation of Portuguese society, uh, society and people. Nowadays, it's the 15 preoccupations of the city chambers. Um, so, bye now. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> so, I just want to, um, uh, just to, for clarification, so you have a political will, like you had everybody in agreement that, that the decriminalization policy was what was required, and it was a run out of the Health Commission. But what happens to sellers? What, are they still, they're still within the criminal system, is that right? Okay, so now we're going to switch over to legal access and hear about some of these models that will address what the Portuguese system of decriminalization and other systems of decriminalization doesn't address, which is sales and supply. And so um, I'm going to have to start on this end um, with my dear friend Steve Rolls from Transform. He has written a fantastic publication about how to regulate all sorts of drugs. He's going to be focusing here on what it would look like to have licensed venues with where you get legal access to psychedelics. So, Steve. Okay. Uh, um, thank you very much. And uh, I, I just, just before I start, I think it's, a, it's really, really important that we are having this discussion. And, and, and kudos to DPA for pushing the boat, not getting too stuck on cannabis stuff. You know, we need to push the boat out. And you know, it is the next, it is the next frontier. Is, is, is psychedelics and, uh, and club drugs and stimulants. And I, it, it's really important we're having this conversation. Now, I have to pay particular tribute to the amazing Steph, who is a, a, a really pioneering and a global leader on this. So, I just want to hear Most of the experience we have in regulation, and I apologise for anyone who's in the last session, so I'm a bit of a stuck record on this stuff, but most of, the, most of the experience we have with uh, regulating drugs is either with alcohol and tobacco, uh, which is obviously a very useful body of experience, or it's with um, cannabis increasingly, we now have a whole range of different cannabis models, uh, including uh, consumption venues in terms of uh, the coffee shops in the Netherlands, and we have more commercial models in the US, and we have more state control models in Europe, right? so there's a whole uh, the body of evidence is now going to be emerging from those, those new models. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, regulation models for uh, medicalized and prescription models for uh, dependents. Uh, so, heroin prescribing and opiate substitution, uh, opiate substitution prescribing and some serum prescribing. Uh, but there, is, there has been historically, I think, it's played a bit of a, a gap in this discussion around the drugs that sort of in the middle. So, the, the, the psychedelics and the stimulants and the, and the party drugs. Um, and I think it's very, very important that we engage in that now because it is the next frontier in, in the discussion. Um, uh, but we, we, we do have an awful lot of um, experience and knowledge around regulating drugs that we can draw on. And it, it really isn't that big a leap to apply some of that thinking and logic just to an area where historically it's, it's been, been absent. And what we did with um, the Blueprint book was basically to say, look, what, what are our policy priorities? What do we want to achieve with our policy? Uh, what, are the, what is the sort of menu of regulatory tools we have for regulating the production, the supply, the vendors, the outlets, uh, the availability and the access to different drugs? And we just basically worked through in a kind of pragmatic, I think, sensible way and made proposals for different drugs that were associated with different levels of risk. I think it's, it, it's important to 
um, say that there isn't one there isn't a one size fits all. Different psychedelics, different stimulants, different drugs are associated with different levels of risk and are associated with different uh, types of behaviours. And your the regulation model that you adopt has to be responsive to that. And uh, so, so there isn't a one size fits all. We have a menu of tools and we have to apply it as appropriate to different drugs and different environments to deliver the kind of outcomes that we want to do to public health and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, <coughs> psychedelics is a particularly interesting area because uh, the, the, the main experience we have for, for regulated psychedelics uh, historically is, is more informal, traditional uh, cultural regulation. It's not sort of formal legal regulation. I'm sure other others will say, say more about this. But I, I think what we need to do is to look at some of the lessons that we can take away from uh, <coughs> traditional regulation of psychedelics um, <coughs> and how we can bring them into a wider culture. Because clearly, um, the way that psychedelics are used in, in traditional societies is not necessarily going to be directly transferable into uh, a, Western, a, a, a Western environment or a developed, developed world environment or a sort of commercial system. So what we need to do is to try and draw the lessons from that and bring them into how we move forward here. So I think there's basic, basic lessons. One is uh, that we have to have a culture of respect. Psychedelics are powerful, potentially powerful substances. We need to be respectful of that uh, and not treat them lightly. Uh, I mean, certainly they are low risk in terms of overdose potential and dependency, but they are still powerful substances and we need to be respectful. In the same way that traditional cultures use of psychedelics always have been very respectful. Um, we need to think about safe space, we need to uh, and consumption within a uh, safe environment, and also consumption with some sort of uh, supervisory presence or, or guiding presence to make sure that if someone does have problems or if they do start to get distressed, there is someone there to look after them. Um, in terms of how you would actually make these things available, we do have to start looking at things like are these things going to be retailed and who is going to be selling them and how are they going to be sold. Um, and, and a model that we've taken a certain amount of um, guidance from is essentially the model of a pharmacist. So the idea that you have someone who is uh, licensed to retail a particular product, um, but they also act as a gatekeeper, so they have to uh, act within a licensing framework, so they have they, they have to enforce things like age controls, or not selling substances to people who are visibly intoxicated, or uh, whatever regulatory framework we put in place, the gatekeeper of the market has to act as an enforcer, and they are licensed to do that. But more than just a, a sort of legal gatekeeper in terms of the regulatory structure, they are also trained to give support and advice. So they know about the effects of drugs, they know, how, they know about harm minimization, uh, and they are trained and required to give advice to people who, who buy. Now, if, so essentially we're talking about over, it's a bit like over-the-counter pharmacy sales. You have a trained gatekeeper who can give advice. Um, and that strikes me as being a, a sensible retail model for drugs that occupy this, this central space. So, so they're not so dangerous they need to be prescribed. Uh, and they're not so safe that they can just be made available like uh, Coca-Cola or chocolate. So you have a sort of um, a regulated retail availability. And that, I think that that model could, in, uh, in, in theory, be translated into a, uh, a, a, a retail and consumption venue. Now, a retail and consumption venue, it sounds a very grand term. A bar is a retail and consumption venue, or a cannabis coffee shop in the Netherlands. Retail consumption venue. So what you're doing is you, you essentially take the, this idea of a sort of pharmacy sales gatekeeper trained uh, individual who acts as a sort of access to the products, and you put it within a, a venue, whether it's a nightclub or whether it's a sort of spiritual space for exploration. Um, <clears throat> but as well as having the, the responsibilities of a vendor, obviously if you're in a, uh, a consumption venue, they have additional responsibilities in terms of care for people who are consuming. And again there, we've got a very solid, uh, it's, it's some of the, the amazing work that Steph's doing in terms of uh, welfare services at parties and events, both for stimulant users and psychedelic users. There's a good, there's a really solid body of evidence about how to look after people who are using drugs. 
So you combine a sort of pharmacist style retail with best practice in terms of care for drug users in uh, events or in, in, in venues and there you have what I would view as a sensible model for psychedelic and stimulant regulations, whether it's in the sort of spiritual domain or whether it's more in the party domain. And, uh, and I'd like to apologise that I actually have to go. So if you blink, <laughs> if you blink and I suddenly look a bit younger and better looking, it's because Aaron is going to take over for me. <laughs> it's perfect you did public spaces. And so I'm going to move to our next speaker, uh, Amanda Fielding, who is, uh, she is, uh, she runs the Beckley Foundation in the UK and does a lot of fantastic research with psychedelics. And she is here to talk to us a little bit about what it would look like to have legal access for people who are using psychedelics at home, the things that we need to think about and keep in mind for that setting. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, home use is, uh, I suppose, a euphemism for recreational use, which is a taboo word, basically, in a sense. And it's a kind of Cinderella of use, when it's not really meant to have it. But, um, I, just a little brief note, I was introduced to LSD in 1965, and in 1966, I got fully involved in the science underlying the mechanisms which bring about the change. And that, for me, became my passion, was to understand how these incredible substances work in the brain to bring about the changes they bring, because I thought they could be such a benefit to the individual and society if we use them responsibly. So I set out right then to um, come this way, and I'm delighted how far we've got, particularly in the last two years, because suddenly all three suddenly had a shift which is very exciting. Um, so, in 1998, 17 years ago, I set up the Beckley Foundation because I realized I could be more um, productive as a foundation instead of as an individual. And that really meant I just got a lot of very important scientists on my board, which gave me a certain gravitas. And I, I think my speciality was seeing what needed to be done. And in drug policy, almost everything needed to be done. <laughs> because it wasn't based on scientific evidence. It would appear, um, you know, prejudice and ideologies, etc., etc. So that's what I started to do. There was no word for drug use. There was only drug misuse. Um, cannabis and the psychedelics were never mentioned at drug policy meetings, either in the UK or around the world, the UN. They didn't exist because there were no real problems. It was all about heroin, methamphetamine, and cocaine. And so I started introducing those topics and I gave um, seminars of top whatever, politicians, scientists, those sort of people at the House of Lords, which was a kind of suitable setting to give it gravitas, and brought these topics to their attention and then wrote papers or reports on them. So slowly an evidence base began to pick up. So now we got to really um, and an amazing <coughs> advance which happened probably around 2011 when slowly um, respectable people came to say that our drug policies are a disaster and we need to rethink them. Um, so basically in the field of cannabis and psychedelics, currently they're scheduled in the most harmful category of substances. I mean, yeah, it's similar to nuclear weapons, but it's in the <laughs> medicine level. They have no medical properties, they're extremely dangerous, and they must be exterminated, basically. Um, well, that policy hasn't worked, and what we should really do is reschedule them, which actually governments can do within the UN. And if we even reschedule cannabis and psychedelics from Schedule 1, which is the most dangerous category, to Schedule 2, then it enables scientific research, which at the moment is amazingly blocked. I've been trying to do it for 30 years, 
and still only this week, uh, research on LSD was blocked because it was LSD. And using LSD as a treatment for alcohol addiction in one of your leading universities um, was blocked because of the problems of it being LSD. So it goes on, this story, but if it was in Schedule 2 or Schedule 3, it would make research much easier and furthermore, doctors can prescribe them. And both of those things are essential for us to move forward. I mean, Portugal has done the most incredible work in making people realize decriminalization does not mean that all the young people start to be misusers of drugs. In fact, misuse has fallen in Portugal, and there are a wonderful model how decriminalizing works. But actually, we need to go much further. We need to change the UN conventions and re-legalize these things. But actually, that only happens in pragmatic steps. So I think the next step is to reschedule. Um, so within the, the um, next move, um, the sounds we're doing, and it's happening from limited number of people, but around the world, and we're all getting very positive results, and slowly governments are realizing that they could save a lot of money by looking into these techniques to treat um, depression, addiction, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, all of these things which are fairly untreatable at the moment. And also, it's a crime to deprive the patients of these potential treatments. But the research we're doing is getting amazingly good results on the whole, quite unusual. I mean, I was involved in research at um, Johns Hopkins using psilocybin to treat um, nicotine addiction, and it has a pilot study, small pilot study, 80% success rate. At, um, so now we're doing a bigger one, at um, the Beckley Imperial Program for Psychedelic Research, we're just doing psilocybin and depression, small pilot study, but again, amazing results. Um, and there are many other indications that these substances get to the heart of the matter. And one of the things I do at the Beckley is brain imaging studies to try to find out how they actually work in the brain. And amazingly, over the last four or five years, we've done some very interesting research which really does show how the default mode network, um, its control, its repressive control, uh, is broken down. So there's a disintegration within the individual networks <coughs> in the brain. And, um, but I must get on, I can see. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so, um, to home use. Some people won't want to do it at clinics or at um, spiritual gatherings, but they'll want to walk in the woods or go to a concert or enjoy themselves. So they need to be protected too. How do we protect them? I think these people should be allowed to get um, pure products. And um, so those outlets can either be pharmacies, and these could be registered medications, so you have, have a special person who would tell you about the potential dangers, and you'd have to maybe fit in a literature and be aware of all the dangers and how to take it safely, or maybe head shops, but licensed head, basically licensed outlets, so that people get an education if they're new time users of how to use it. To begin with, they'd have small amounts um, to avoid. Um, passing on, but if they can show maybe re responsible use, um, get a certified responsible use, or whatever one calls it, then um, maybe they could get larger amounts. Um, because what, what the government should be is like a good parent, protecting as far as possible against the harm. How am I doing that? Um, um, so, um, um, so, yes, we need responsible use, and uh, maybe the people can go to a <coughs> clinic. I mean, obviously one has to have clinics where people can get treatment, um, psychedelic aided treatment, but also maybe they can have an area where new type users can come and learn how to use. There can be wonderful groups like Ayahuasca showing us how 
a group which is um, looked after by uh, a guide, a knowledgeable person, is a very good way. But for those people who don't like that sort of thing always, that want to go their own way, they too must be protected. And we can do that. We can work out a system. Now, at the back here, actually I'm involved in doing two reports, one on psychedelics, MDMA, cannabis, and psychoactive substances, the regulation of these, and another one, which is so taboo one doesn't even dare mention it, is the possible regulation of coca and cocaine, which is destabilizing the whole of Latin America. So we need to face that regulation is the way forward after decriminalization, which Portugal has and Netherlands have so bravely set the first steps in. Thank you. Thank you. So we had a couple of speakers, Steve and, and Aram by proxy, sort of explain what it would look like to have licensed venues. We have Amanda explain a little bit what home use would look like, what's needed. Now we're going to move into two other models that you're probably likely a little bit more familiar with, um, that we may have heard a little bit more about. And Amanda had mentioned ayahuasca, and in fact, uh, Constanza Sanchez Aguilas will be um, speaking to us about the ceremonial use of ayahuasca. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, and many thanks for joining us in this discussion. Um, well, I, my name is Constanza, as Stephanie said, and I work for ISOS Foundation. I take care of the legal area of the foundation. We are mainly focused on the integration of uh, ethnobotanicals, ayahuasca, iboga, and other um, plant materials in contemporary society. So this is just to frame the, the the model I would like to, to speak about to you today. Um, well, I work, as I told you, I work with them um, to avoid, to, well, to avoid people having legal troubles for the utilization of the botanicals, and, I, and also I support people that already have been prosecuted to, to get, well, to be acquitted or to be, like, dropped of charges. So, uh, this means that my work is not on the, like, let's say, the spiritual uh, angle of the whole of the botanical <coughs> frame, but more but, like ground-based. It's very like with deals with real life, real problems of the people utilizing this uh, botanicals. This said, um, also we are based in Spain, which has uh, witnessed uh, the development of a very uh, sophisticated model of cannabis clubs, associations, which are private users associations that get together to uh, supply themselves in a non-profit basis without resorting to black market and, and with the name of, uh, of uh, having a collective uh, use of, uh, of cannabis with broader social um, objectives to, for instance, to work towards a more integrative society. So we thought that, yeah, now I'm just envision the, the future as we were told to do. It's like, why we, mm, we thought, why don't try to apply this cannabis of private users association model to other substances, for instance, to anotanicals and for the ceremonial use of ayahuasca. And we, with this, I want to to say when I was preparing this uh, this uh, presentation, I thought I was thinking that this is really like we take a model which is framed in a provisionist uh, uh, scam as an inspiration for a future world, a post-prohibitionist world, where private users can also have legal access um, to, to these materials. So it would be something in between licensed venues and home use. So why is it interesting to apply this model uh, to, to ethnobotanicals, and especially ayahuasca? Well, I have to say what, what, when one approaches to, to ayahuasca from the drug policy frame, 
the first thing you realize is that it's very challenging because ayahuasca and other botanicals who are utilized in ceremonial contexts like peyote or agoga, they challenge the traditional categories of uh, drug policy, um, of, of the way we think from the drug policy frame, especially in two ways. Uh, well, the first is that it challenges that this difference between uh, recreational and, and medical or therapeutic use because they, they could be used for many purposes. So ceremonial use, as, I, as we discussed, is more, it's a more appropriate term because uh, things that they are used collectively um, by a group of people, but these people may have different aims <coughs> for consumption or utilization. It could be like Increasing self knowledge, knowledge. It could be like personal growth. It could be like overcome a traumatic experience, uh, etc. So there can be many, many ways in which this, um, this, uh, or many aims for the utilization of the substances. Then, as this ayahuasca and the botanicals uh, materials, they challenge. Uh, um, these drug policy uh, categories, they also challenge the way we envision legal access to these uh, kind of substances. So, I will now move to explain exact, exactly how this model may look like. And if you think, well, let's say in fact, inspired in the, in the Canon Social Club uh, model, we have a Imagine we have a group of people, like 30, 40 people ideally, so they are <coughs> users of uh, ayahuasca, they wish to continue their use, they meet together like five, seven, eight times per year, they are, um, they are willing to continue their use, but they want to supply themselves, they don't want to buy to anyone else, they want to harvest their own uh, substances or they want to import it from a local grower or, or they want to make a collective purchase so they want to really supply themselves so it's a closed circuit of people, they know each other so they decide in this like kind of future, like post-prohibitionist future that we, we envision but we don't know still how it will be look like it will look like so, um, so they decided to set up this association, and they have to deal. They have to deal with many four areas. One is like the legal and administrative part of the association, which, which deals with the uh, how this uh, well the, the the administrative activities that they will have to take care of for setting up the association, which uh, which. Uh, means that they, they need to elaborate an institute, define objectives, they define a way at rules of functioning, financing, funding, staff rules, etc. And in this context the admission of new members is an important issue. Am I okay with Okay. So there should be like inclusion criteria, for instance being a previous user or, or, or previously knowing someone in the in the association. So there is no advertisement, there is no incitement. It's um, it's not for new users. It's just for like veterans, I'd say. Also, um, there is a whole area uh, that deals with um, safe and health because uh, botanicals are, are not free of for risk. So there should be like a way of integrating some uh, criteria of exclusion, evaluation of the psychological and physical health of the people joining the association, etc. Another area of, uh, of activities in order to set up this association would be that the, the uh, let's say, ethical responsibility issues because consider that we are moving in an area where people can reach an altered, altered state of consciousness that means that the, the person facilitating the experience and also the group needs some rule on how to behave under certain situations so they need to 
develop a set of rules and protocols concerning ethics and responsibility. And finally, the, the activities that deal with the supply side of the, of the association, which uh, basically, as I mentioned, is um, how to supply from the, from the ayahuasca. It could be like the harvest, which is maybe quite challenging. It could be like have a contact in the Amazon or elsewhere to, to get the substance. So, um, just uh, to come to an end, I would say that this, of course, during my speech, you have, I'm sure you have identified many challenges that a model like this may entail, but the benefits are probably more than, than, than the challenges, and I think it's the way we should explore in the future, and hopefully we'll be able to. So we'll go from ceremonial use now to a model that probably we're most familiar with, at least here in the United States, which is the medical or therapeutic model of legal access to psychedelics. And to speak to you about that, as a man who probably needs no introduction in this room, but I will introduce him anyway, is uh, Rick Doblin. here coming out and also for uh, DPA to, to focus on this so much. Um, the, the first thing I'd, I'd like to, to leave you with is that the way that psychedelics will be regulated as medicines is going to be largely determined by how we do the research to make them medicines. And so there's two sort of new breakthroughs that I wanted to share first that, so that you'll have that in the background. So a week ago Friday, a week from yesterday, we have just a tremendous breakthrough at the FDA. And so we're trying to do work with MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder, and we're doing a lot of work with veterans and others with PTSD, and we've tried to align ourselves with the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense. And there's been some resistance there, but through the work of Richard Rockefeller, who died a year and a half ago in a plane crash, he, he's helped us a great deal, along with his um, cousin, Senator Jay Rockefeller. And so the first project that the Veterans Administration suggested that we work on together was with therapists that they have worked with that have developed an approach called couples therapy. It's cognitive behavioral and joint therapy where one member of the couple has PTSD. And so now we're working to blend MDMA with this cognitive behavioral and joint <coughs> therapy. And what we wanted to do was to give both members of the couple MDMA, even though only one of them has PTSD and is the designated patient. So a week ago last Friday, the FDA said yes to that. It took a lot of careful crafting of the protocol. And so this is the first time in um, the history of the, the renaissance of psychedelic research over the last 20 years that more than one person will be able to get MDMA or any psychedelic at the same time. Um, the, the second thing that's new for us is that we're, we've just completed negotiations with a pharmaceutical manufacturing firm in England and we're purchasing a kilogram of medical grade MDMA. So it's a... So it's a legal drug deal <laughs> for the $350,000. And this kilogram of MDMA will stay at this facility for probably the next um, five to 10 years. And they will ship it out all over the world where we have the appropriate protocols approved and import and export permits. And then, it's pretty impressive. They're also the same firm that's gonna be making the psilocybin for the effort of research. All right, and then the third thing that's been about the last uh, year and a half is that through the 15 years or so that we've been working um, at, with FDA permission to actually give MDMA to therapists, um, we've developed a really good relationship with the FDA Division of Psychiatry Products. And the person that was the head of Psychiatry Products at FDA retired several years ago. 
and he felt that we were doing a good job, we were trying to do it the right way, so he's agreed to be a consultant to MAPS. So we have sort of the inside view on how the research should be done and then also how it should be regulated post-approval. So I think we're doing this in a, a thoughtful and a gradual manner and we're trying to sort of open up and I think that's the other key thing to think about is that this is really going to be incremental change. So how we're doing the research is MDMA assisted psychotherapy or our study with LSD, LSD assisted psychotherapy. So we're proving that MDMA can be effective for treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. We have other studies with autistic adults with social anxiety, with people that are anxious about dying, with life-threatening illnesses, but it's only safe in the context of psychotherapy. It's not the drug that is what's doing the healing. It's the drug plus psychotherapy. So what that means is that the evidence that we're generating about safety and efficacy only comes from the combination. And therefore, as a medicine, this will be only approved in combination with psychotherapy. And so then the question is, who is going to be licensed to prescribe this drug? And the answer from the FDA's point of view is only people that have been trained in the method of psychotherapy. And right now, from the DEA's point of view, only doctors can prescribe, can get Schedule One licenses to do the research. So it will end up, at least initially, it will be only doctors that can prescribe MDMA, but they don't need to do the therapy. In our Boulder study right now, we have a doctor who works for a psychologist. The psychologist is the principal investigator. The doctor has the Schedule One license. The doctor gives the actual MDMA and then leaves, and then leaves it in the space of um, two psychotherapists. So there's not even a doctor in the room. We've, we've demonstrated enough safety so that what this then means is that we can expand this to the idea of a clinic model where there's a doctor that gets the license, can prescribe it, has been trained in the therapy, but then the psychologist will actually work with the patients, will also be trained in the psychotherapeutic method. And then they can modify it a little bit, but the safety comes from that. And who would do the training? It's the sponsor, it's the organization that ends up um, teaching and licensing the therapist. So MAPS will become a trainer of therapists, a licensor of therapists. And then it will only be able to be administered, I believe, in certain kind of clinic settings, in special facilities where people can stay overnight, where there's room for a night attendant to sleep, where everything, everything should be videotaped and audio taped. There's been instances of sexual abuse of people who gone to underground therapists. We've seen that a little bit with ayahuasca tourism. So we have a male-female co-therapist team model, and I believe for safety reasons, there'll be videotapes of all the sessions. A lot of times that's for therapy reasons, because people want to review their videotapes to, to think about what happened to them again. And then there's going to be, at least initially, a lifetime limit on the number of times people can get MDMA in a therapeutic setting. And that's because that will save us many millions of dollars on toxicity studies. Uh, because, you know, for drugs that are chronic that you get from the pharmaceutical industry that, or even like marijuana for PTSD, which is administered on a chronic basis for years, you have to know a lot more about the toxicity than you do if it's only administered acutely. So we will have probably a lifetime limit of around 10 sessions. And then the the way that we're going to end up doing this is a single pharmacy to keep track of it. So just the way that we have the MDMA now located at a single facility in England, there'll be a single pharmacy it will, and there'll be a patient registry. So from a libertarian point of view, you could say this is kind of a nightmare. That, you know, people who take MDMA will be tracked, there'll be a record of all the patients. But part of it is to permit off-label prescription so that if physicians want to prescribe it for something other than MDMA, we need to know what that is. There needs to be a record of that, and then the more stuff that accumulates for MDMA for autistic adults, let's say, that's a clue. Now we're going to try to do research in that area. And then the idea is that these clinic settings can expand the same way that we can give two people MDMA as part of the couple. What about the families of the person that's 
um, anxious about dying or the families of people with PTSD, they suffer as well. So I think this medical model can start to expand where we bring in other members of the family and treat them in these supervised settings. <coughs> and then eventually this could become sites of initiation, like for ayahuasca or for any other things where people can take a psychedelic in a supervised setting and then they understand what it is and then they get a license to go out and do it on their own in a not medical setting. But that's, that's I think, how the, the medicine can eventually help us open up to um, widespread cultural use for non-medical purposes as well.
a broader sense on like legalizing psychedelics, we're still quite a ways away. But I think there's, um, you know, what Transformed does such a good job doing is laying out just the scope of what drug policies can be. Um, you know, on one far extreme, we have prohibition, which is a complete abdication of regulation. Um, and then on the other far end of the spectrum, we have, you know, total free market, libertarian, wet dream, legalization, <laughs> um, where there, there's no controls at all. And in between that, there are so many, there are dozens or hundreds of different permutations in between those spectrums. So it's a, it, you know, we don't need to think of it as, you know, all, all or the other. Um, and so I think a couple things, um, I'd like to focus on doing more in the, in the short term, in the immediate sense. We have all this momentum right now for criminal justice reform, um, and there's thousands of people getting arrested and imprisoned every year for psychedelics. Um, I'd like to see us try and integrate um, psychedelics more into the criminal justice reform work that's going on. Um, you know, why not try, you know, eliminating mandatory minimums for psychedelics. Um, why not try ending arrests for I'm not saying that's the answer. I just kind of feel like I have to say that because it's almost felt weird over the years that no one, I haven't heard anyone else say that. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, there's, I, you know, I, whenever I'm at these psychedelics conferences, you know, the talks that people love are the really visionary talks. People who like psychedelics like to be visionary. I feel like my role in some ways is to kind of be the boring one and say, okay, well, that's great, but what, what can we do right now in the very short term to actually integrate this into the drug policy work that we're already doing? And I mean, Stephanie Jones is one of the best living examples of that. Um, uh, she started a music camp program at the Drug Policy Alliance as our nightlife community engagement manager. Um, and one of the best ways we can reduce the role of criminalization in with regards to MDMA and psychedelics is by ending uh, zero tolerance policies at the places where people are most likely to use them, such as. You know, universities, nightlife settings, festivals, and, and stuff like that. Um, I guess before I finish, I should also just say sort of what my qualms are about this, or where my ambivalence comes from as well, in that um, part of the problem with drugs is, uh, you know, how we've got into this situation with a drug war where things are just so far away from where we want them to be. I think part of the root of it is that people tend towards have a, have a very dualistic view of drugs. There's good drugs and there's bad drugs. Um, and every society uh, <laughs> seems to do that to some degree. Um, and I think we need to be very careful as we push reforms forward for psychedelics that we're not throwing uh, people who use other drugs under the bus. Um, <laughs> No public health or scientific or ethical or moral reason for bringing uh, someone who is using psychedelics into the criminal justice system, but we also know that's the case with any drug. And a lot of the same principles apply that dose, set, and setting um, are all the most important factors, more so than the drug itself. Psychedelics can have risks. Some of you might be surprised to hear that. Um, I know when I tell most people this, they're surprised or they just don't believe me, that even with drugs like heroin or methamphetamine or crack cocaine, um, at least eight, according to the federal government's own data, um, only about 10 to 20 percent whoever of people who ever try those drugs develop an addiction. Um, so we need to acknowledge that the same myths that have uh, created psychedelic prohibition have also led to the prohibition of other drugs as well. And you know, we need to make sure to educate ourselves about um, what the science really says about, about other drugs as well. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll move into that.
really fast, and I'm going to open it up so that you guys get a chance to ask questions. But I want to, before we do that, just acknowledge the fact that when I was receiving this session, I really was stretching folks to look into the future and be very specific about what legal access would look like. So please give our speakers a round of applause. Polydrug use, I'll say, is that 
at least initially, working through the FDA, you need only one variable at a time. But what we're really talking about is psychedelic medicine. It's not MDMA is the best drug or psilocybin is the best drug. So these psychedelic clinics that we're talking about, people will be trained in the use of MDMA, they'll be trained in the use of psilocybin, and any other drugs that make it through the system. And so what I've found is ideally that somebody would get um, a sequence of therapy sessions with a range of different psychedelics. <coughs> And that will maybe be 10, 15 years from now that we'll be able to study that. Um, and, and just as a last thing to say that we've noticed that a lot of times when people are doing LSD or the classic psychedelics and are having a difficult time, if you administer half a dose of MDMA, then it becomes something that they can manage more successfully. So I think that there's a lot to be said for polydrug use, but just the way science and medicine goes, we have to do one thing. And I'm going to go over to Aram because he was very nice to join us and hasn't had a chance to speak yet. And I think in <laughs> licensed venues where we have poly, poly substance use is a, a big question. So do you want to speak to that? I'll, I'll, I'll try to, um, to take the question, I think, in two pieces. And if, if you bear, to bear with me, because I'm, I feel a little bit slow today because of my own poly use last night. <laughs> 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 I think it's pretty is one that the first part of it has to do with communications and, and how you sort of deal with polyuse, which is a reality, you know, regardless of our morality, whether people like it or not, you know, that's, that's what people do, they use different things at the same time, and they experiment with that. I think when you open that, that argument in public opinion, you lose a lot of the support that you get for, for legal regulation. Because people tend to think, oh, you want to regulate so that you're able, you know, this is going to be common mess of the, the four horses of the apocalypse are going to come into the room. Um, I think one of the main interesting things from, from a policy perspective, however, is that with legal regulation, one of the main things you achieve is that people know what they're consuming. Those and behavior change because they're in a controlled setting. Um, and with that, you reduce all of the uh, in, a, in a legal context, you are able to provide a lot more information, and with information, people can and will choose how to polyuse or not. They will know what the impacts at an organic level will be, but will also be in a more controlled situation. And I think that would be the main argument, um, again, from a policy perspective, on uh, you know, regulation will probably allow polyuse. Uh, they will do it under a more secure um, and, and healthy environment. Okay, other questions? Right here. Um, so, so I'm thinking if, the, uh, if there's ever a wider legal access to just like just community, um, it might be important to pursue uh, widespread. Nintendo style spaces and like even back in high school, okay, we learned how to care for someone with alcohol poisoning. Now let's learn basic trips that are going to be. So do you think there's any room or do you think there is a reason to start pursuing that? Zendo. Zendo. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I think you just left the room, but Andrew Tarski in New York just started a program called, I believe, Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care. Um, that some other people at the conference are also involved with. And that's going on right now already, where people who want, who are preparing to uh, take a psychedelic or considering it, or have taken it and want to talk to uh, a, a therapist uh, to help integrate their experience, that's something we can already start doing now legally. Um, and yeah, it, it's almost surprising with Andrew's program that why, why hasn't anyone done that sooner? You don't need to go through the FDA and the TA and all that stuff to get that done. So um, that, that, yeah, that's a great point. You can't have uh, decriminalization and legalization without ramping up health services and education. Otherwise, that can kind of be a recipe for a PR.
our disaster. Yeah, yeah and I think Paula spoke to that as well as what made decriminalization work so well. We didn't, I didn't mention this, but Paula also volunteers for Cosmic Care, which is the Zendo social. say one thing, which is that um, you can't teach high school or students or college students how to trip well, but you can teach them how to help a friend if they're having a difficult experience. And so um, the Unitarians have a terrific program on sexual education for their kids, and they developed one on drugs, and they asked us to do the one on psychedelics. And so I just want to point out that we had a tremendous video about how to help somebody having a difficult trip, and Jack was the person that had a difficult trip. I mean, do we think about uh, decriminalization as a package deal? Do we want to try to get all the rest of the drugs done at once? Do we want to divide them up? We're talking about medicalization. It seems like certain psychedelics would be easier than maybe others or stimulants. So how do we want to sort of think about that? Should we do these drugs separately? Or should we create little package deals? That is a great question. There's really, I don't have a yes or no answer. I think, honestly, what I'd like to see more of, to prove myself, is, is really in-depth, uh, methodologically rigorous research to figure out where the public is at there, what kinds of messages would work best, um, and whether separating out psychedelics would really uh, give us a really big strategic advantage or, or not. Um, I think my, my gut reaction is that, you know, in some ways I'd rather not separate it out because there's already, we're at a point in this country where no one is arguing for arresting drug users anymore. I mean, de decriminalization, as in Portugal, um, has not, uh, you know, we, we haven't quite got to that point of popularizing that, but at the same time, you have all the presidential candidates basically saying, on both parties saying that, you know, you know, drug, drug users basically should not be incarcerated, which is a big step towards that. Um, so I don't think we want to, um, uh, if we're going to separate out psychedelics, we need to do it in a very careful way. Yeah. I, I must add that actually in Portugal there is a law, the decriminalization law, uh, it um, decriminalized all the substances. So, and I think it was the point it's not to distinguish them. Because the risks are there, they are different. But we are not talking about the substances at all. We were talking more about how to deal with that, what to do with a more like that. And not on the prevention program, on the arm reduction programs that we have launched, the, the substance is not the issue. It's more about the avoiding the situation, how people deciding to use it, how what is the the, 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 the rule that the substances uh, have in their lives and so on. So most of in some uh, even with children and so on, in the prevention program, most of the times we don't talk at all of substances. But they are there. So the thing is how to deal with that. How what they represent in our lives. It's it's uh, uh, promote awareness more on that and not the, 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 the question. If I may talk very briefly. In the international debate, they like to say, you know, we want to build, build new drug policies that are based on the human rights framework and has a public health approach. I think that's the basis upon which you build and say a public health approach is not to criminalize a person for you know whatever drug they're consuming. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if that's not a pure, the appropriate response from the state, from the society, from our communities, then you know what is? And that's that's the sort of policy debate that you know different types of regulation we have. Uh, but criminalization is never the answer from a, from a public health approach. 
uh, fight their country, it adds on a lot of risks and harm. Um, and so I think once you build it like that, I think you know, decriminalization goes all together. You, you need to decriminalize drug use, and then you need to take a step forward and think how you're going to regulate those markets. Um, yes, absolutely. Okay, I think decriminalization will come be illegal drugs is an essential first step so you can educate and treat a person as a human being. Um, but then I think um, going towards the regulated um, market, possibly then one can slightly package uh, different categories up. Psychedelics have a very traditional use of medicine and for benefits of society. And also there's a lot of good research on LSD in the 50s and 60s and how it was in the treatment of uh, alcohol addiction and other things. Um, so I think they're very valuable candidates for um, scientific research to show just how valuable they are to the individuals and society. So if one has to package up so not to optimize, you know, maximize the shots too much, uh, then you get psychedelics because there's so much evidence which is coming through that it can be built on. All right, one more question. Can we go back here? Here you go. Uh, okay, I think this is like a two part question, and it's about a very narrow, narrow um, it's a narrow question, but then it's a broad question at the same time. And my question is this. In some jurisdictions, actually, there is a movement to criminalize a psychedelic substance. And that's the case with Salvia de Venorum. Uh, kind of a quasi-legal area, illegal in some places, illegal in some countries, uh, really a, a complete mishmash of, of, of law. And then this substance is so, is so little known about it, can anyone on the panel point to any research or, uh, that is being done possibly, uh, and I do believe that it, it is a, a psychedelic subject, it's plant substance, plant medicine, am I correct in that? I just need some clarification. Thank you. Rick, do you want to take that? I don't know who might be able to answer that one. Uh, yeah, well, there, there is, um, uh, salvia can come in a lot of different forms, and it, they're, you know, it, it's um, like a lot of other drugs, you know, that when it's in the, uh, the plant form that you chew, it's more um, easily integrated than when you snort it or, or smoke it. Or, so it's, uh, a lot of people have had very frightening experiences with it, and there is a lot of uh, interest in regulating it, and, and I think there's not a lot of research about therapeutic uses at all. There, there's starting to be some research, uh, both at Johns Hopkins and elsewhere, about what Selby does, which brain areas it works on. And I think it's, it sort of gets lumped into these novel psychoactive drugs, and I think it's very difficult for us to slow down their criminalization. I think we just need to object and say that the criminalization, like criminalization of other things, doesn't really help. But I see that uh, we're largely in, ineffective in that way, and I think Selby will be you know, increasingly criminalized in, in places all over America and elsewhere. And it's, um, it's a difficult substance to, to work with in a therapeutic setting as well. So there's not going to be a lot of research with it uh, in that context. So I, I think it's just uh, part of this discussion about decriminalization. We need to sort of, you know, add that drug to that whole concept that it doesn't help. But, but I, I think it, the, the momentum is going against it. I think Silvanora A, which is condensed for them, can be a very unpleasant drug. Um, <laughs> so hopefully it will kind of criminalize itself, if you know what I mean. Okay, so we have five minutes left, and it's been an incredible sort of conversation, hopefully just the beginning of the conversation. I want to remind you to fill out your evaluations, so in two years we can have more sessions like this if you liked it. Um, and I'm going to go through and ask the speakers to give their final like words, whatever they would what you want the audience to take away from this session, or maybe what they can do to help put us on the path towards one of these models of legal access. Or I'm going to start with you, which is entirely fair, but maybe it's something to add for decriminalization. So, as I said before, as I said before, I think the legal access is not 
more and more implements, more and more best practices, and uh, more and more um, awareness on society because people have have a word to say on what is best what they want for themselves. So I think it's uh, and uh, I think it's uh, the question on words is similar for the question other questions uh, because we live in a consumed society. We consume so many things, not only drugs. So I think the important issue is to take uh, the, 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 the don't put the question only on the substances, but put the question of what what kind of set that we want to involve the people deciding what is best for them. And to define this war on drugs doesn't make sense because we are on war the world the world doesn't make sense. So I think it must be a, a work together uh, uh, with the NGOs, with uh, all the people that are involved that, that have responsibilities and show by evidence and best practices that uh, the reuse of drugs can be a moral or an opinion issue. Yeah, I, I totally agree with, with Paula that uh, we are we should go far beyond substances or even type of uses and think about what kind of society we, we really want to build from this specific area we deal with every day. And, um, and I would say that uh, we should work through um, or to improve our knowledge on these substances, on this type of uses. Because the war, the war on drugs must come to an end, not only because it causes a lot of harms, but also because it denies the access to the benefits, it denies society the access to the benefits of psychedelics and ethnobotanicals that could be a great contribution for, for humanity and for a better society. lessons I think we can learn from other social justice movements and a lot of us have noticed about gay marriage and gay rights and one of the key things there was people coming out. So I think all of us here in this room have a role to play in the social change that we're trying to make with psychedelics. And I think if you can come out about to your family, to your parents or to your kids or to your co-workers, um, we, we had a, a major um, successful business person who's very well known and um, he said that he was involved in the discussion in the, in the media about the microdosing LSD for creative purposes, and he was uh, anonymous. And I said, well, what would it take for you to acknowledge this? And he said, well, maybe if you had a thousand people and we'd all come out together, then he'd be willing to do it. So we only need 999 more, <laughs> but we're trying to do this. So, <laughs> Really, all of you should think about coming out to wherever you can in these maybe difficult conversations. And then the other point is that it's important for us to try to think about the patients that we're trying to treat with psychedelics or the people that we say this is for. So it's not for you know aging baby boomers who use psychedelics when they were young. It's for other people. And the thing that I'm most proud of right now is that in our current study with veterans, for political reasons, we said we would just call the study veterans, firefighters, and police officers. And we didn't think we'd get any firefighters or police officers. But in the end, we got 22 veterans, three firefighters, including one from 9-11. And we got a police officer who had trauma from their work. So I think this idea that this kind of psychedelic psychotherapy is something that we need to have compassion for the police. They have one of the most traumatic-inducing jobs that you can imagine. And they don't get treated for it. And they're like the military. They're not supposed to talk about it. So I think. The idea is to sort of think about psychedelics and present it as for the mainstream as much as we can, and that will help with the integration of it. Yeah. Um, I, I think um, decriminalization of all drugs is a win-win situation. Um, and to, the regulation of all drugs is actually a win-win situation. To take it out of the hand into the hands of the government, who surely can do a better job at 
uh, regulating different categories of job uh, drugs to try to minimize harm. But I think the psychedelics have a particularly strong case to fight that it really is a criminal act to keep them so highly criminalized because we're depriving society and individuals of incredibly valuable tools for self-development and for treatment. And I think a lot of effort should be gone in way over a thousand people should put up their hands and say we must stop this travesty of human rights and really do the research so that um, their full value is recognized and made available. Uh, just a couple final points. I mean, one thing I should add that I think we could be doing in the short term to help improve public opinion for reducing the of criminalization and psychedelics policy is to not just publicize uh, their potential benefits, but also to do the work of debunking all the unsubstantiated myths about psychedelics that are vestiges of the drug war. Uh, for example, there was a study that came out last year, um, that looked, a very large longitudinal study, that looked at millions of people who have used psychedelics and whether or not they went on to de develop mental health problems. And they found that there was no causative link um, be between using psychedelics and mental health problems. I think a lot of people you probably talk to, you know, they might say, well, okay, it's beneficial in that situation, you know, but I had this one friend in college who, you know, thought his best friend was a glass of orange juice and, you know, uh, it's never the same again. Um, and we need to, you know, and that helps look at the, the, the broader sort of socioeconomic situation that leads people to potentially have mental health problems um, that, that are at the root of that. Um, and you know, and I'm just really, I'm very ambivalent about the question that was brought up earlier by Jared about, you know, whether it makes sense to single out psychedelics in uh, campaigning for ending the criminalization of drugs altogether. I don't have the exact answer, but I think whatever we decide, we should make sure to base that decision on sophisticated communications research. And I say that, you know, I'm a communications guy, so of course that's what I'm gonna say. But you know, I need to look at where, you know, knowing when there's when there's a valid initiative for like marijuana legalization or sentencing reform, that's usually when there's money available to do very in-depth messaging research. Um, but when you just have sort of this broader issue out there, no one's gonna want to spend money to do these sort of uh, a more kind of long-term and abstract things, but I think we need to look at, do the research and look at it and say if there really is a huge advantage to, to singling out psychedelics in a certain way, and we can get that now, and we can do that with, without hurting our overall longer-term goals, yeah, of course we can do that, but honestly, you know, I, I just, I, no one has done that research, uh, so it's still kind of an open question. Thank you. Final words. Um... Just to say, everything that Steve mentioned and uh, what I mentioned is published in, in a book that's free to download in uh, Transform's website. Uh, it's called uh, Blueprint for Regulation. It's also translated to seven or eight languages. Um, so feel free to use it if you're interested in you know, what, what is it that we're proposing when it comes to regulation and various, and various drugs among the uh, psychedelics. We have one book of cannabis in particular. Uh, and we recently began doing a bunch of briefs on different uh, models of regulation around the, around the globe. So we just published one in Colorado, we have one in Portugal, Switzerland, and so on. Um, so yeah, feel free to visit the website and carry on the conversation. Thank you.